Hi, everybody. You have no idea how glad I am to be here. I'm Georgia May Mosholder, and today, here in Texas, it was 108 degrees. And that doesn't bother me if I'm in my apartment, but I had to go downstairs. And I took the elevator down, and when I came back, something went wrong with the elevator. I got in, and it was warm. It was hot. But it wouldn't open it. My, I live on the second floor, and it wouldn't open it up at all. And I'm, oh, Lord, I don't want to die today <laughs> of heat stroke in an elevator. So I tried whatever, I tried pushing numbers time after time, and finally, after quite a long time, it worked. And I was so glad to get out and get back to my apartment, call them up and reported the problem there. But here I am. I am alive to do this again. And we are back with incomparable explorations in the character of God. Now, I've done 10 other readings. So if you are just getting started, you go back and start at the beginning. But this one is the mother of compassion. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she would have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Isaiah forty nine fifteen. Yahweh does not have a gender. He is spirit, neither male nor female. But to make him comprehensible to us, he is often pictured in gender-specific languages, as a father or a husband, or as here in Isaiah, as a mother. Isaiah 49. This verse does not mean he is female any more than the Lord's Prayer means he is male. Nor does it mean we should talk about him as a she. The Bible writers use masculine pronouns for God, and so does Jesus. So we should too. But it does mean that there is an aspect of his character we can see more clearly by talking about him using the image of a woman, just as there are aspects we can see by calling him a rock or a hiding place or a shield. Without thinking, this makes him an it. That aspect is compassion. We, as humans, have four types of compassions. The moment most common type is momentary compassion. This is the feeling I got when I picked up the newspaper this morning and saw pictures of bodies severed by a bomb blast in Mumbai. Animals do not have the capacity to feel sorry on behalf of creatures they do not know, but people do. And we feel it whenever we turn on the news. Yet this type of compassion does not bring us to action. I'm not going to live differently as a result of the feeling I experienced on picking up the paper this morning. In this sense, my compassion is limited. It is not very noble, but momentary and therefore totally unlike God's. Sometimes, though, compassion does compel us to action. Usually this is merited compassion. It what causes us to give to UNICEF to feed starving children in Africa. We see people who deserve better. We feel their pain and we want to help them. But this compassion also is limited because it only extends to those who, in our view, deserve it. My wife, Rachel, is currently working for a human rights organization and she was rec talking recently about how hard, hard it is to motivate people about prison conditions. She remarked that people want to see pictures of helpless babies and rescued child prostitutes, not prisoners. We all distinguish, subconsciously or not, between people who deserve compassion and people who don't. Fortunately, this type of compassion, too, is unlike God's. Where would we be if only those who deserved compassion received it? Occasionally, we will experience missional compassion. This is where we know that people are difficult, that they may not deserve it like the next person, 
and that they may not give much back, but we shall still show them compassion, because we are driven by a purpose, a, a mission, which enables us to overlook many of their failings. Aid workers, community and social workers, and often health professionals fall into this category. The nine-year-old runaway who swears at everyone and smashes things is harder to love than the sweet, wide-eyed one. But we find ourselves able to persevere because we have a wider mission, our job, our church, the child's family, or whatever. Yet even this is not like God's compassion, for unlike him, all of us have a breaking point. There are only so many times we can be ignored, rejected, or verbally abused before we leave that person and help someone who will let themselves be helped. Compassion, driven by mission and not by relationship, will not cope with continual rejection. The only thing that will is maternal compassion. It is hard to think of a person who gives less back than a young child screaming in the middle of the night, totally self-absorbed, making mess everywhere, needing 24-hour care, spreading carefully prepared food all over the table, throwing tantrums in the supermarket, biting younger brothers and sisters, and all this without so much as a thank you. Yet there is a bond, a relationship between the two that means the mother continues to have compassion on the child. Mothers of children, even more so of teenagers, face continual rejection, verbal abuse, and anger from their children, but they remain compassionate. Just watch a mother react to her child being victimized or the lengths to which she will go to protect them. This is the picture the Bible uses of Yahweh's compassion for Israel, a rebellious, stubborn, and selfish people, idolatrous and fickle, irresponsible and sinful, always rejecting and rarely respecting their creator. No amounts of monetary or merited or even missional compassion would be sufficient to maintain relationship and love for them or for their equally sinful successors, you and me. Only compassion of a mother for her nursing child is enough. In fact, God says, not even this fully explains it, because there have always been mothers who can abandon their children. So he reminds them, even though these may forget, I will not forget you. We have all witnessed this. I have seen the motherly compassion of God restoring couples who have done everything in their power to ruin their marriages rescuing backsliders who had run as far away from him as they could, setting free from addiction those who had lived their entire lives without God, and of course, continuing to forgive me for the lies and lust and laziness I repeatedly give in to. Like tiny children, we do all we can to make our parents abandon us, but we have a mother of such infinite, infinite compassion that we will never be forgotten. Jesus Christ. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark 1.1 1, 1. Sometimes a name is all you need. In the English-speaking world, names very rarely mean anything. My wife's name is Rachel Wilson. But she is neither a female sheep, nor a son of William, or of anyone else. In the Pitcairn Islands in the South Pacific, though, names have more significance. A day's exploring might lead you up the hill of difficulty, toward the pagan idol graveyard, down the god. Or around the threatening sea cliffs, Johnny Fall, where Dan Fall, and where Freddy Fall. If you were a particularly adventurous cliff walker, you might encounter the, the more ominously named Oh Dear, or my personal favorite, the abrupt Tom Off. 
The names tell you all you need to know. So it is with Jesus Christ. Lots of people think that Christ is Jesus' surname, and few today know what Jesus actually means. But a first century Jew, reading the opening sentence of Mark's Gospel, would have understood exactly what Mark was claiming about this man. If we are not to miss out, we need to look beneath the surface to see what it was. The name Jesus was common enough. Quite a lot of Jewish boys were called that, just like a lot of boys in Mexico today are called Jose or Jesus. But this Jewish boy was called that for a very specific reason. Jesus was the Greek form of the Hebrew word Yeshua, which means Yahweh saves. And the angel made it very clear to Joseph that he was to be given this name because, quote, he will save his people from their sins, end quote. Matthew 1, 21. In other words, the salvation of Israel would take place through this one individual. His name, Yahweh saves. Or perhaps, God to the rescue, reflected this destiny. And there was more to it than that. Another Yeshua, whom we know as Joshua, was the man who had led Israel into the promised land. The era of Joshua's leadership had been the period to which centuries of prophecies had been pointing forward, the time of inheritance gained and promises fulfilled, of rescue and great joy for Israel. The age of Jesus' leadership, as Gabriel and Mary and Simeon and Anna proclaim in the first few chapters of Luke, was the same sort of thing, only more so. So when Jesus was baptized by John, it was not the first time a Jewish leadership prophet called Yeshua had walked into the Jordan River to enact the salvation of Yahweh in fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. It was just the first time it had been accompanied by an announcement from the throne of heaven itself. If the name Jesus was normal, though normal though, Christ was anything but. Christ was a title, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Messiah, which means anointed one. It was the title that Jesus used to refer to the coming king, the one in the line of David who would restore the kingdom to Israel. The Jews expected the Christ, among other things, to be a national ruler, to defeat Israel's enemies, at that point Rome, through military battle, and to usher in the eternal supremacy of Israel over the nations around it, centered around the presence of Yahweh in the temple. David had done all of these things, winning numerous military victories, expanding Israel's borders, and preparing for the building of the temple in Jerusalem. The Christ, they reasoned, would do all of this, but in a more definitive and dramatic way. Jesus did none of them, or at least not in the sense anyone was expected. He was rejected by a lot of people for a start. He couldn't even win over his own family and faced continual opposition from Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of the law, and the temple authorities. Far from leading a national army against Rome, he steered clear of violence against them, healed them, and prophesied that they would eventually destroy Jerusalem. He entered the capital on a donkey of humility, not a white horse of triumph, caused uproar in the temple, and then met an inglorious death outside Jerusalem at the hands of, wait for it, the Romans. It is hard to imagine anyone less fitting of the Jews' picture of a Christ than Jesus of Nazareth. All of this makes it amazing that within 28 years of his death, people all over the world, known world, were referring to him and worshiping him, wor worshiping him as the Christ. To most first century Jews, calling him Jesus Christ was the equivalent of calling me not Andrew Wilson, or even Andrew the Preacher, 
but Andrew the Astronaut. It was simply an inappropriate title for a crucified prophet. Yet his followers continued using it and then took their names, Christians, from it. Why? Well, the answer is simple. They began to realize, largely as a result of the resurrection, that they had misunderstood things and that, in fact, Jesus had done exactly what the Messiah Messiah was supposed to do. He was the anointed king like David, the son of David, and the king of the Jews. Like David, he was the unlikely hero from an unflattering background who had been announced to be king by God's prophet. John, who, like Samuel, had been born to a barren woman after a priestly encounter in the temple. Like David, he had been persecuted by the existing ruler, Herod, who, like Saul, had repeatedly tried to kill the true king. As a result, like David, he had wandered the countryside, keeping a low profile with his tiny band of loyal followers, before entering Jerusalem to be hailed by the crowds. Like David, he had then conquered Israel's enemies, which ultimately were Satan, sin, and death, not the Romans, once and for all and been publicly vindicated through the resurrection. The result was that the worship of Yahweh had gone far farther and the nation of Israel grown far larger than it ever did under David. This, the disciples realized, is what the word Christ really meant. So when Mark talks about Jesus Christ, he's not just giving you a name. He is telling you that Jesus, the Jew from Nazareth, who was crucified by the Romans around A.D. 30, is both the salvation of his people and the anointed king of Israel. He is saying that Jesus Christ is both Joshua and David, Savior and Ruler. And whenever you call him that, you are saying it too. Selah. Wait a second. Wait and worship. I have to get some water first. I'm really dry. Wait a minute. Worshiping Jesus is our purpose, our joy, and our destiny. There are an unknown number of, there are an untold number of good songs and hymns about him which will help you worship. But this hymn, written by Charles Wesley to commemorate the first anniversary of his conversion, is exceptional. Don't just read the words, find a suitable place and sing it out loud. It will build you up in your spirit as well as honoring God. Here it is. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumph of his grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears. Tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoners free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. He He speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful broken hearts rejoice. The humble poor believe. Hear him, ye ye deaf, his praise, ye dumb. Your loosened tongue employ. Ye blind, behold your Savior come. And leap, ye lame, for joy. Look unto him, ye nations, own. Your God, your fallen race. Look and be saved through faith alone. Be justified by grace. My gracious master and my God assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. 
Maybe you could print that out. Go back, copy it out. Here we go. Next one. Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians 2, 9 and 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, verses 9 and 11. Yeah. Four words can change the world. They can incite revolutions and shape centuries. No taxation without representation practically established America. More people than can be counted have died fighting under a banner of four words, no king but God, long live the emperor, live free or die. What language would the French be speaking without, they shall not pass, or the British without, we shall never surrender, or where would American civil rights be without, I have a dream. When you look back across history, many of the most powerful and subversive things that have ever been said have been four simple words. But no words in recorded time have ever been more revolutionary, dangerous, subversive, and civilization forming than these. Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, they may not seem dangerous in the West today, over time, the explosive four-word rallying cry can become domesticated and lose its original meaning. Witnesses, witness the way the statement above, which have become marketing slogans, state mottos, and bumper stickers. For much of history, though, Jesus Christ is Lord has been the most dangerous thing you can say, and in many parts of the world today it still is. This is because it has two extremely radical implications. First, if Jesus Christ is Lord, then no one else is. This is the clearest meaning the phrase would have had in the first century. Jesus is Lord, therefore Caesar is not. Remember the early church did not live in a democracy where everyone could say pretty much what they liked. They lived as subjects of a pagan ruler in a context of imperial worship where signs of undermining the emperor's authority were quickly recognized and brutally squashed, usually by crucifixion. Declaration of the lordship of Jesus, as opposed to that of Caesar, was therefore not a harmless religious statement, but a subversive political one. The closest equivalent we have in recent times is probably communism. In our lifetime, numerous Russian and Chinese Christians have died and been imprisoned because of this obvious truth. If Jesus Christ is Lord, then the Communist Party is not. In 1972, 27-year-old Ivan Mosevyev joined those who by their lives and deaths showed that the lordship of Jesus could not be shared. I will never agree to, silent, to remain silent about God. His commanders continued to interrogate him, trying to get him to deny Jesus. To deny Jesus. They put him in refrigerated cells. They clothed him in a rubber, special rubber suit into which they pumped air until his chest was so compressed he could hardly breathe. A few days later his body was returned to his family. It showed that he had been stabbed six times around the heart. He had wounds on his head and around the mouth. There were signs of beatings on the whole body. Then he had been drowned. Ivan Mosevyev like thousands of others from Stephen onward, was killed because of four words, Jesus Christ is Lord. 
We can believe those words, but it is only when we are prepared to die for them that we really know what they mean. If Jesus is Lord, then no one else is. The second implication is even worse, that Jesus Christ is Yahweh. The Greek word used here for Lord, curious, was the word the Jews used throughout the Greek Old Testament to translate Yahweh. Now this on its own doesn't prove Paul was saying Jesus is Yahweh. The word Lord could also mean master or even just sir. But if you look at the context, you will see that this is exactly what he was saying. Time and again, including here, Paul takes Old, Standerman, Stan, Old Testament passages about Yahweh and turns them into passages about Jesus. Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. Deuteronomy 6, 4. New Testament. For us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for women, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. First Corinthians eight six. Old Testament. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. Joel 2.32 New Testament If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10 verses 9 and 13 Old Testament. For I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn. From my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Isaiah 45, verses 22 and 23. New Testament. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name of that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 9, 10, and 11. What an astonishing thing to be claiming that Jesus of Nazareth is Yahweh. Just as astonishing is the fact that the Jewish early Christians did not for a minute think that this made Jesus a sort of second God or that there had suddenly become two or even three gods. They vigorously argued that there was one God, not least in the passages that we have just quoted, but they also argued that Jesus was this one God the Lord of the world, Yahweh made flesh, and so he is. So when Paul says that Jesus has been given the name that is above every name, this is what he is talking about. Jesus Christ has been given the name above every earthly ruler, Caesar or president, but also above every heavenly power or authority. Jesus Christ is the one before whom all people must bow, whatever the consequences. But he is also Yahweh himself, God made man, crucified in magnificent obedience and therefore exalted in glorious magnificent. Or, in four words, Jesus Christ is Lord. And I'm going to stop there because my, I am so dry. Must be that 108 degree heat. Huh. I'll be back, I promise. This one is only a short recording. See you soon.